Okay, so now talking about uh, technical challenges. I mean, I can think about uh, what uh, what uh, what we do in the labs, for example, uh, when we process multi-domain data, and uh, it happens sometimes that you have a sample, and then you get a microscope image, you get an X-ray fluorescence image, you get uh, an X-ray diffraction pattern of that uh, sample. And then you try, well, if you raster scan, you get an image. But And then you try to re align the images. You try to uh, register the images. And then uh, you get all this data from different sensors, and then you need to transfer it uh, uh, to, a, to a computer. And then, basically, you need to reduce the data. You need to generate knowledge. You need to synthesize that knowledge. And then you need to translate it in a way. I mean, you need to test hypotheses so that you can make informed decisions. I mean, all this stuff takes time. And it takes uh, computing power. So how do you approach the data transfer uh, between elements of the mosaic and avoid the time-consuming sneaker net? Yep, uh, uh, great question. So what you just described, uh, you know, I, I kind of at a real top level talked about these three thrust areas. We have planning, execution, the one in the middle we call interoperability, which is exactly this problem you laid out. So, so the way, the way we, we're, we're tackling that um, is... To some degree, it's not exactly one to one, but it, to some degree, it, it parallels the ISO network stack model, and and so we start at that physical layer, and so you know we we've done research in the past, and we'll probably continue to do some research on how do we make sure that given nodes, you know, given tiles, if you like, or or just different data sources, how can I make sure I've got a physical pathway that can move data between two points? You know, it's, it's interesting because uh, I personally think one of the biggest problems is how can we make that process as, again, adaptable and flexible as possible, but at the same time not making it overly complex? Again, sorry, another metaphor. Uh, but the best analogy I, I, I've seen is comparing a Swiss Army knife to a Dremel tool. I can make a Swiss Army knife that does everything. I can make a radio gateway that speaks every part of the spectrum and every possible protocol. The, the reality, though, is that that node is probably going to be uh, insanely complex and, and insanely expensive and, and large and power-consuming and all the rest of those problems. The more Dremel tool model is maybe I want a node that only speaks two different waveforms. But I've got a bunch of those. Maybe, maybe I can build that smaller and cheaper. But I can take a bunch of those and scatter it, you know, throughout the environment. And again, statistically, it's live, you know, being willing to live with that degree of uncertainty. Statistically, you know, I have enough density of, of those sort of bilateral phi-layer nodes that I've got high confidence of being able to connect any two points. So those are some of the things we're kind of looking at at the physical layer right now. And the other interesting little little side problem that gets to the software engineering side of the world. You know, people certainly today know how to do software-defined radios. Uh, you know, GNU radio is out there as an open source capability, as an example. The, and, and DOD, US DOD, has invested a lot of money in software-defined radios in the past. You know, back to the abstraction theme, there's a real challenge in the balance between efficiency and flexibility. I can build a computing platform, you know, some radio card with a bunch of FPGAs and DSPs and such. And I can bring in an expert on that card and do a really efficient job of writing the software. And I can get a tremendous amount of options and signal processing power and the types of waveforms I can choose using that methodology. The problem is, if I ever want to change the card or ever want to do the software, it's back to the drawing board with a big design problem. And oh, by the way, it's got to be that expert. That's another thing we're looking at is how do we create layers of abstraction where we can break apart the process of doing the math and creating the signal processing from the people that are building the hardware so that both of them can evolve and, and be adapted, whether it's because of a different platform, a different mission, different provisioning, new technical opportunities, whatever the case might be that the hardware and the software can evolve independently of each other. So that's, all of that is, is one big problem area. As we move up the stack, so to speak, we, we're doing a lot of work right now in software-defined networking. 
And, and one of the big problems that, that DOD has, and again, but the, the military is not alone in this, a lot of these issues would be less technical challenges if we were a completely green field kind of environment. You know, I just want to throw away everything I've got and start from scratch. You know. The reality is, that I, I don't know how many trillions of dollars of, of sunk capital equipment's out there. There's a lot of legacy equipment. Uh, some of it you know, was fielded you know, much before I was born. We can't just throw all that away. So a lot of what we're doing is how do we create layers of virtualization on top of this very heterogeneous mix of legacy equipment. And so that's been another big area of research for us. And, and we're looking, we're slowly adding more capability. You know, the, a first step might be, you know, I, I'm stuck with whatever's provisioned out there in terms of the actual network hardware. But how can I manage the data more smartly in, in a virtualized uh, network? Ultimately, as we have new options, like maybe a new software-defined radio or something like that, I might have more knobs that I can turn, and I can do more to actually control and flex that networking environment in addition to managing the flow of the data. As I move further up that stack, you, you, you touched on a really important point when you're talking about the different you know, sensor types and, and the different you know, types of analysis you might want to do or something like that. And just because I can pass data between two points doesn't mean it's useful to that endpoint. The software can understand it, the people there can understand it, the machines can actually talk to each other. So we've really been focusing a lot on that problem of data level interoperability. And this is a little bit of heresy in the standards world and, and a lot of the people that worry about this problem on a regular basis, but we are uh, pretty against the notion of enforced global standards. Um, and, and the reason for that, uh, there's nothing fundamentally bad about it, but the reason for that is that, one, they require a lot of work to decide on them. Two, they usually come with compromises, either in functionality or performance. Uh, three, uh, after you've gone through all the pain of creating them, they're usually out of date by the time people start using them. So instead, we've, we've, we've actually built a technology that does auto-generation of translators to move between different data types. And what's really exciting about it is it's not just a syntactic, you know, convert data formats. Those examples you gave of where things have to be, you know, measured and characterized in different ways, that gets down into a very semantic description. And what's cool about this, this software tool that we've got, it's, the, the, it's some tortured acronym that I, I can't remember what it stands for, but the acronym spells very uh, suitably, STITCHES uh, is the name of the acronym. If you lay down an architecture and say, here's a whole set of different systems that have to talk to each other, and they've got all these different message types, they lay that out in a graph and hit compile, and it will generate a set of executable code that are all the message translators. And again, it's, it's message translation at an actual semantic level, not just doing syntactic data formats. So those are the types of technologies we're looking at and, and the types of things we're worried about from that interoperability perspective. Yeah. So, yeah, what I was saying was about uh, sort of the question about parallel computing instead of using a central base where you get to gather all the data there. Uh, transfer everything in one single place and then you process everything there and then you distribute it to the operators or wherever instead of adapting uh, adopting a sort of distributed approach where processing happens uh, in many nodes is that some sort of more acceptable uh, approach or uh... yeah we're we're really big on trying to push a, a very uh you know d distributed kind of capability yeah. we don't like the idea of everything having to come back to a central spot it creates brittleness. It also loads up your networks. Uh, the, the interesting thing in all of that, it, it really ties back to that theme I raised earlier about abstraction and composition. It, you know, if I can be able to abstract individual elements into these, these partitioned uh, chunks, if you like, a uh, you know, collection of tiles, I can make very simple types of high-level decisions that then are left to those individual elements uh, to, to implement. It's, it's how a lot of human military operators uh, in, in the West function, this, this notion of mission command, 
Yeah. And we're trying to build the same thing into software and into architectures. Yeah, and uh, the other thing was that uh, how do you avoid overflow of information with the operators? Well, w- once again, if we're not centralizing information, you know, if we're partitioning, you know, I'm sorry to be a broken record, but I come back to abstraction and composition. If, if uh, you know, let's take for example of, you know, in one of these, these distributed war game kinds of environments, you know, you might have a small army unit you know, with a missile battery. And, and let's say they want to use their missiles as part of some, you know, targeting solution, you know, with the Air Force, you know, flying a radar sensor. To your point about information overload, if those poor guys in the Army at the missile battery had to have every piece of information in the battle space and from every possible sensor, and they were distilling all of that themselves, you know, how would they pick out yeah. how they should use their missiles? If with this, you know, very distributed, you know, decisions happening in different layers and in different pieces and in different locations, you know, I might have a node someplace that without knowing the details of that radar or the missile battery saying, hey, those two things would would go well together. And then they give out tasking. and, And then the guys in that army missile battery say, you know, I don't really know the overall battlefield context, but. I was told I need to launch a missile at these coordinates. I know how to do that function. Yeah. And, and so it's, it's, it's the same kind of thing that gets to human management of information is the same problem you started out with of, from a control perspective, a decision perspective. How do we manage dimensionality? They're all part of the same problem. And the other thing I wanted to ask is about uh, how do you uh, put together mosaic warfare and logistics? Because, I mean, the... the pieces of the mosaic, it needs to be taken to the place where the war is being fought or whatever. If you don't talk about war, you talk about something else. It's always the same thing. There is logistics involved. So the way we're looking at that, and part of this or- is organization. You know, again, I started out talking about DARPA and saying we're not the office that does platforms. So rather than saying, hey, what's a new way to physically move things? We, again, look at most of the problem sets through the lens of information. So we actually have a program underway right now uh, that is looking at awareness of logistics. So it's it's creating, it's almost like Uber for military logistics. It's trying to say, uh, and in fact, one of the things we're also really big on, you know, this is another variant of Mosaic, but it's Mosaic of how we're actually doing the the, uh, software engineering. We're big into a lot of the current modern software practices of microsystem, uh, microservices. And, and so we, we've got our approach to logistics is to build a microservices architecture where we're building a lot of, of, of heavy computational types of algorithms for doing things like how do I go find logistics-related information? How do I do correlations? How do, what are models for doing forecasting of various different kinds? On the top of that, we're building a very app store-like environment Hmm. where there are individual functions that can reach into, you know, that sea of heavy computational uh, information and, and create certain products for different users' problems in that logistics chain. So, for example, the organization that has to figure out, should I go order more parts? Uh, that's a very different problem than the organization that says, how am I going to ship them off to a little island someplace? Uh, and that's also a very different problem than the user who, says, who wants to know, when's my stuff showing up? And, and so we're able to, you know, the analogy to Uber is, you know, there's one big cloud uh, analytics environment that, that Uber builds, but the app for the consumer versus the app for the driver versus the app back at the place that's doing billing are all very different lenses yeah. into that sea of data, into that computation. So that's, that's kind of how we're looking at, at the uh, logistics problem. Thank you for listening to this conversation with Dr. Timothy Grayson. And I'd also like to thank uh, DARPA's communication team for making this possible. If you enjoyed this video, please leave a comment below, like, subscribe, turn on the notification bell, and support this channel on Patreon. This podcast will be also available on Spotify and Apple Podcasts, and you can find the links in the description below. Thanks for watching.